Half of today's message is a pop quiz. Or a papa quiz. It's being posed by Papa Dixon here. Do you believe that and this? That's the title of the message. And perhaps more properly it should be called, Do you believe that and this? Do you believe that and this? Well, one of the things, that, let me give you a little orientation here before we get started. The reason for this message is I find a lot of people who claim to be Christians, and I'm not doubting it. I know the way it worded that sounds like, uh, but, well, maybe there's a tiny bit of leaven of disbelieving about whether they're Christian or not because they'll say they believe this in the Word of God but uh, I don't know whether I believe that and so what I want to do is pose to you a few things and then you need to stick in here because the conclusion is motivation and direction and encouragement For you in believing God's word. Too many people say they believe this, but they don't believe that. So we're going to go through some of that. And again, I, I run into this frequently, honestly. Talking to Christians, let alone non-Christians, but Christians who should believe everything. So, Here's the pop quiz. We're going to start off in Isaiah, and uh, it's a pop quiz, but it's a serious quiz. And I mean for you to answer, if you would, to yourself. You don't need to write me a note, but uh, you're always welcome to write me a note. But the first one concerns, at the time of Isaiah's prophecy, the Messiah that was yet to come. No time with God, a lot of things in the Old Testament spoken of as present or even past time when it's a prophecy about something that is to come. Isaiah 53, and I'm going to read verses 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And this is uh, <clears throat> out of the New American Standard. The second part of Isaiah 53, I'm going to read out of the JPS the Jewish Publication Society. They've done a little bit better job on a few verses here than my New American Standard, or probably whatever Bible you use. Anyway, Isaiah 53, 5. Now listen carefully so you can be sure that you're giving the right answer in this pop quiz. Referencing the Messiah that is yet to come. He was wounded for our transgressions, or he was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, go astray, and we turned everyone to our own way, and Yahweh, or your version probably says, Lord, and Yahweh has made to fall on him the iniquity of all of us, of us all. He was oppressed, though he, he was oppressed, though he afflicted and humbled himself and opened not his mouth, as a lamb is led to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, and with his generation, who considered he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich his tomb, although he had done no violence, neither was there found any deceit in his mouth. I said I'm reading the first part out of the New American Standard. I think that was out of JPS also. All right, now, the question is, do you believe that? 
do you believe that Messiah Jesus came and he came to die for us, die in our place. He lived a perfect life. He went through trials and tribulations. His face was emaciated by the time he was nailed to the cross. He shed his blood for the remission of my sins, your sins, the sins of the world. The Father laid on Jesus while he's on the cross all of our sins. And Jesus paid the price and paid hell there on the cross that we might be free, that we might not be guilty. It shouldn't even have, not only not guilty, but the penalty's been paid by someone else, and we shouldn't even have conscience of sin if we're going to believe God, believe what he says. So anyway, the question is, do you believe what I just read? I read Isaiah 53, 5 through 9. Do you believe that? Well, I have to make some assumptions here since I can't hear you, but I'm going to assume that you answered in the positive with that. All right, now two verses above what I just read, and remember I started in verse 5. Two verses above that, which would be 4 and 3, here's what it says, only I'll read it as Isaiah 53, 3 and 4. He was despised. Now remember, this is all just one passage. I just read starting at 5 and following. Now I'm reading 3 and 4. <clears throat> he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of pains and acquainted with disease. We don't see him ever sick, but acquainted with disease. And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely our diseases he did bear. There on the cross. He did bear. And our pains he carried. Whereas we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now do you believe that? Do you believe this? that he came and suffered and died for the remission of all of our sins. Do you believe this? Do you, I mean, do you believe that? Do you believe this? Same passage. Same paragraph. He carried all of our diseases. The maiming. The paralysis. The cancer. The everything. There on the cross. If you believe verse 5 and following, why wouldn't you believe verses 3 and 4? You believe that, do you believe this part of it? All right, second question. Isaiah, excuse me, Psalm 103, 1 through 3. Psalm one zero three one zero oh, three or zero three starting at verse one bless the lord or bless yahweh O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord O my soul and forget none of his benefits who forgives all of our iniquities do you believe that? I'm going to read it one more time. The question is, in this pop quiz, do you believe that? Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who forgives all of yours and mine, my iniquities, sins, transgressions, lawlessness. Do you believe that? Do you believe this? I didn't finish the sentence. In There in verse 3, I didn't finish the sentence. I finished, well, verse 3 says this, who forgives all your iniquities. 
but the rest of that sentence is, who heals all your diseases. Do you believe this? You believe that? You believed, I'm assuming you answered yes. Psalm 103, 1 through 3a, what about the rest of the sentence? Who forgives all of our iniquities, all of our sins, who heals all of our diseases. If you believe that, why wouldn't you believe this? All right. <clears throat> Question three. I'm only going to, let's see. I'm not going to do more than five, and maybe I'll only do four. I've got plenty of time, but I don't want to beat the horse to death. All right. Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, do you believe that? Come on. Do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth? Do you believe that? Isaiah 42, beginning at verse 5, well, just verse 5 says this. Thus says Yahweh, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread the earth and its offspring who gives breath to people on it and spirit to those who walk in it, in the earth. Do you believe that? Thus says Yahweh, who created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, God, in the beginning, God created. Revelation chapter 4, going to the New Testament, 4.11. Worthy are you. There's praise and worship in Revelation 4 and 5. Awesome passage of Scripture. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. You, Yahweh God, you, Elohim, you created all things, and because of your will, they existed, they were created, and they still exist. <clears throat> Do you believe all that? Do you really believe God created, just like Moses wrote there in Genesis, Isaiah, John the Beloved here in Revelation. Do you, believe, do you believe that? Well, I've got a question for you. In Genesis 1.31, God saw that he, God saw all that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Chapter 2, which is just the very next verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. And when that day was over, Everything he created, he saw was good, and it was done in six days. Well, <clears throat> verse 2 says, by the seventh day, by the seventh day, not on the seventh day, by the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. <coughs> Excuse me, 
God rested on the seventh day from all of the work that he had done. Verse 3, Then God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, set it apart from the other days, because in it he rested from all of his work, which God, which he, God, had created and made. Do you believe that? Do you believe God created all that stuff? And do you believe, you believe that, you believe he created it all? Do you believe this? He did it in six days, and that was it. He rested from that work on the seventh day. By the seventh day, all of creation had been completed by God. Do you, you believe that? Do you believe he did it in six days? Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For it, and this is chapter where we find the Ten Commandments, also in Deuteronomy 5. For in six days, in six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them and he rested on the seventh day. And that's the reason, or therefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. He sanctified it. He set it apart. So you believe that? Do you believe this? It was all done in six days. And if you're not going to believe this, why would you believe that God created? Why would you believe part A of sentences and not believe part B of the sentence, like we saw in Psalm 103, verses 1 through 3, like we saw in Isaiah 53. God's word is not a smorgasbord. And I'm not through with the, with the examination, with the pop quiz yet, so I'll hold off on that. Um, okay, two more, two more. And I, surely, you know, I could do this kind of quiz all day, going through Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. John 14, 6. What chapter? John 14. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes unto, comes to the Father but through me. You can't go around Jesus by way of good works or Buddha or Allah or anything or anybody else. Jesus said about himself, I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Do you believe that? As a Christian, you better believe it. If you don't believe it, I don't think you're a Christian. If you don't know and believe that Jesus is the only way. He was God in the flesh, the Son of God, the Lamb of God. He is the only way. He's the truth. And that He's the life. <clears throat> and by His own words, which were the Father's words, no man, nobody, no man or woman or child or anyone, comes to the Father but through Jesus. Do you believe that? That was John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Let's just go down a few verses. Let's go down five verses. Still in John 14, five verses. Jesus said, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, 
believe because of the works themselves. You've seen everything I've done, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, giving sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, restoring limbs, paralysis healed, constant issues of blood, curvature of the spine, everything. Believe me, I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. Now, if you don't believe that, at least you ought to believe because of everything you've seen me doing. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, that he's saying, that ought to convince you. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he, that means us, you and me, will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. Do you believe this? You believe that? Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You believe that? Do you believe this? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. And he continued on saying, whatever you ask me in my name, I'll do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatever you ask me, I'll do. Do you believe this? you believe that? Go down five verses, a sentence or two. Do you believe this? <clears throat> well, I don't see anyone doing it. Don't base your faith on what you see in Mike Dixon or anyone else. Our faith needs to be based on the Word of God. you believe that? Do you believe this? Last question. i got a whole bunch more. I'll limit it to five. James. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any man lacks wisdom, James speaking, writing by the Spirit of God. But if, if, but if any of you lack wisdom, let Mike Dixon, let you ask of God who gives generously liberally, I think, in the King James, who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given him. Him, her, you. If any of us lack wisdom, let's ask of God, because he'll give generously the wisdom, the God kind of wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, don't need that. Anybody can have that. We want the wisdom from Anothan. We want the wisdom from above, from God. If any of us, any, if any of us ask of wisdom, lacks wisdom, let's ask God who gives liberally and doesn't get mad at us and will give us much, much, much wisdom. Do you believe that? Well, let's stay in James, and let me ask you this. Do you believe this? James 5. That was in James 1, 5. This is in James 5, verse 14. Is any among you sick? Then he must call the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord. And the prayer in faith, not just a prayer, not just a, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. I'm not making fun of that prayer. I'm saying, but it's not like that. It's just not just something that you repeat. It's the prayer of faith. And the prayer of offered in faith, or the prayer of faith, will restore, heal the one who is sick. 
and the Lord will raise him up, and if he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven him. They were all taken care of at Calvary, but our feet need to be washed daily. That's in John 13. We're not going to talk about that right now. You believe James chapter 1 verse 5, don't you? If any of us lack wisdom, all we have to do is ask God who gives liberally, generously, and without reproach to us, He'll give it to us. You believe that, do you believe this? Are you sick? Call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint you with oil. And the prayer offered in faith will, absolutely, shall, without doubt, heal the sick. And the Lord, Jesus, you pray that in Jesus' name, and Jesus will raise him up. And if he's committed, if he, we, they have committed any sins, they will be forgiven. Do you believe this? You believe that? Do you believe this? Why, why is it that so many Christians, children of God, pick and choose. I believe this, but not this. Oh, I believe that, but I don't believe this. I believe in the heaven. I don't know whether I believe in the hell. How could God do that? <clears throat> All right. Let me see what time it is. Oh, I'm going to, I should give in a whole bunch more illustrations in the pop quiz. I'm going to end early. Here's the point. Here's the point. And I want it to be, I don't want guilt to be put on you or me. I want us to understand that God's word for us is not a smorgasbord. You've all been to a restaurant where you can go down the line and, and you can pick this and leave that and Pick this and a little bit more of this. And you don't want any of that. And we like those smorgasbords where we can just pick and choose what we want. Then generally we can go back and, well, pick this, but now nah, I don't want any more of that. I'll take this. Scripture, God's Word, is not a smorgasbord. you got to take it all and not just sample it. we got to take it all. Eat it all. Digest it all. And certainly, we need to read Scripture, but we need to study it also. You need to learn how to study. I tell you, I, I, I feel moved. I don't know whether it's my own emotions or the Lord, but I may have, uh, I may record it on YouTube, um, but I'm really thinking about having some sessions of teaching people how to study the Word of God. If you don't know how to study the Word of God, you can certainly be reading it. Be praying before you read. Be praying while you're reading. But we need to read God's Word. And we need to study God's Word. And not... You learn these words in, in seminary. You probably know them without going to seminary. But there's exegesis and there's eisegesis. And eisegesis is when you read into the scripture things that aren't there. Exegesis is you're getting out of the scripture what God has said and what's there. We need to exegete scriptures and not be putting things in, putting our own thoughts into it. We need to have that mind of Christ. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says this, and I'll bet a lot of people can quote it, and that's good. Pasagrafe theopanustas, or you might say it in English, all scripture 
is inspired, or all scripture is in it's God breathed. It's not inspired, it's God breathed. All scripture. Pasagraphe Theopanustas. All scripture is God breathed and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. That doesn't necessarily mean spank, 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 but getting back on course, for correcting our course, for correction and training in what's right, training in righteousness by faith, training in righteousness, so that the man, woman, child, church of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. The Word of God is it's awesome, it's powerful, Hebrews 4.12, it's powerful, but it is just awing. It feeds our soul. It encourages us. It increases our faith. To the extent we believe it, you believe that, do you believe this? Hebrews 4.12 does say, for the word of God is alive or living. It's alive, and it's powerful, and it's sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts, or even the intentions, the intentions and thoughts of our inner, inner man of our heart. The Word of God is awesome. Don't be... Don't be making God's Word into a smorgasbord where you're going to choose to believe that but not believe this. I gave you five examples. I could give you easily about 17 more but probably a hundred more. determine, and this is by God's grace, and you might have to make it a matter of prayer even. God, I'm going to believe everything that I read. I'm going to believe it all. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, help me as I read this and study it. It is theopanustos. It's God-spirited or God-breathed. The Holy Spirit, Peter said this, that the Spirit of God moved on men of old, carried them along to have them write down what he wanted written down. Prophets did that. New Testament writers did the same thing. This is God's Word, and it's for us, for our benefit, our closeness to God, our strength and our health in the kingdom of God. And we can, excuse this kind of a worldly term, but tap in. We can, the more that we grab hold of all this, we can tap in to so many more of the blessings that God has for us. While we're in this world, well, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. Amen, that's good. Nothing's more important than that. But you're missing a lot between now and that day. You're not only missing it for yourself, you're missing it maybe for your kids, your neighbors, your husband, your wife, mom, dad, children. You're cheating them to the extent you believe that, but you don't believe this. You could help them. Don't you want to help? Well, I'm going to get my son a job. I'm going to let him come in to be partner with me in the company. Okay, that's good. But that's going to go away. The things of God are for eternity. And God has so much for us to enjoy and bless here and now. 
the psalmist wrote, David wrote back in Psalm 119.11, Your word I have treasured in my heart. Not part of it. I've treasured a part of your word, God. No. Your word. Your word. The word of God. I have treasured in my heart. Do you treasure it? All of it? Don't give a smorgasbord answer here. Can you say with David, King David, a man after God's own heart, can you say with David, your word I treasure in my heart? I bet you can. Just need to keep it for ourselves. In Psalm 119, 105, he said, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. We're living in a dark world. We are to be lights. But our flashlight, so to speak, our spotlight in this dark world is God's word. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Is that what it is for you? And if it's not, you're stumbling and making an awful lot of stupid mistakes. Mike Dixon, I'm not alone. John 17, 17, I refer to John 17 with some frequency because that's our Lord Jesus's, and we call it the high priestly prayer. You hear me saying that frequently. We hear him say, and this is an easy passage to remember, John 17, 17, John 17, 17. He said to the Father, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Do you get that? Well, in, in this pop quiz that, that I gave to you, I said, God created the heavens and the earth. And I said, do you believe that? And as a Christian, I'm assuming you believe that. Then I read, in Exodus 20 and in Genesis chapter 131 through 221, he did it all in six days. Do you believe that? You believe the first part? Do you believe the second part? What did Jesus say? Sanctify. He's praying for us. Father, sanctify them in set us apart from the world, world thinking, world acting world doing set us apart from them. he's praying that we would be set apart he's he's there at the right hand of the father right now ever making intercession for us saints sanctify them in your truth your word is truth i'll make that the end of my pop quiz today. Do you believe that? His word is truth. <clears throat> maybe not Maybe not what some professor said. His word. If the professor is not saying what the word does, if God says I'll supply all of your needs, do you believe that or not? No smorgasbord. His word is true, and he is praying for us to be sanctified, made holy, set apart. In truth, and it's his word that is the truth. All right, that's all I've got for this morning. This evening, by God's grace, I'll be right here at 6.30, and... The title of the message is Man's Free Will. Well, uh, and the end of that is I may have a better question for you. Anyway, so that's it for right now. Have a good day, I pray.